Coming up in this week in computer hardware, HoloLens, we got hands-on. DirectX 12 is finished. New NVIDIA bundles, AMD's dropping power, SSDs you might not want to buy, and hey, we got a ship date for Oculus Rift. All that and more coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C A G F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 314, recorded May 7th, 2015. DirectX 12 finished, more AMD news. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Pro Flowers. Mother's Day is May 10th and Pro Flowers has got you covered. Get one dozen rainbow roses in a free glass face for just $19.99 plus shipping. Visit proflowers.com, click the microphone in the top right corner and enter the code TWIT. And by iFixit. You can fix it and iFixit makes it easy with free step-by-step -step repair guides, high quality replacement parts and all the tools you'll need. For $10 off your purchase of $50 or more, go to ifixit.com slash twit and enter the code TWITCH at checkout. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware. I'm Patrick Norton, joined as always by Mr. Hardware himself, Ryan Shrout, who is bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, and had to remember to come home from lunch because we've got a new recording time. And I suspect that means it's going to be a very high-energy show for you guys today. Hey, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of the uh, after instead of the after dinner slump, <laughs> I'm in the after lunch slump. Really, the only time I'll be energetic would probably be about 10.30 in the morning, my time, which is 7.30 in the morning, your time. I don't think anybody wants to be in the studio at that point. Or you probably don't want to be up recording a podcast at 7.30 in the morning either. So You you know, let me explain to the, one of the big changes in your life that's going to happen when the child arrives uh, later this year. Yeah. Uh, it's not really the whole thing about, like, your life changes, the fun that I I don't think of, I think of 7.30 as sleeping in at this point. Like I'm leaving for the <laughs> office at 7.30, you know, at some point yeah. your kid gets to be about two years old and what you have is a fully mobile 30 pound alarm clock from hell, but a cheerful one that's going to bounce on your chest and be like, dad, dad, hey dad, are you awake? <laughs> I <laughs> and, had, I and had a very similar... Commence. I had a very similar story to that this uh, this weekend. My niece and nephew were in town and they were staying with us. And I, I believe it was about, it was 7.38, I think was mm -hmm. the exact time. I remember it very vividly. My niece opens the door to my bedroom and kind of yells in, does anybody want to get up yet? And that was, <laughs> I guess we will. I guess we will get up. So that's fine now. So <laughs> I, I'm, I, I feel like I'm preparing every day a little bit more. Yeah, that's uh, that's good. Spend lots of time with. Uh, spend a lot. It's just keep your family close. All right, we'll do. Family close. So you guys, before we get into the meat of of today's show, which amongst other things uh, considers uh, concludes the future of AMD's GPU prowess. So you have give away the 20th anniversary Asus GeForce GTX 980, not just a GPU, but a stylistic achievement, the likes of which we haven't seen in quite some time. No orange. No black, but gold. And not like that sort of apple gold that's kind of meh. This is a full-on in-your-face, you want to bling the snot out of your machine gold. This this is the gold of championes, my friend. What do people have to do to win this beautiful card? You know, not much. You got to go to the Asus PC DIY page, uh, which is linked on there. Uh, and then you can just, that's the only thing you have to do to enter, really. And then there's a whole bunch of optional ways to enter if you're a subscriber of this or a follower of that. Uh, but it's a really cool looking card. They're only making 200 of these for North America. Uh, and I know a handful of websites are going to give them out. We happen to be one of them. I don't have a picture in this post, but the back of the card is all, like the back plate is that all gold color. Um, and so it's it's pretty extreme looking in terms of computer hardware for sure, uh, but but well worth it I think, especially since it could be free for you. So, and not for me, but for anyone in the audience. From somebody, I am exempt from these glorious giveaways because Ryan hates me and my family. <laughs> Thanks, man. Well, I'm and and actually. Far. <laughs> you know, actually, Pat, I rarely think of you at all. Um, the uh, Sorry, I'm thinking of a line from a movie, uh, Casablanca. If you haven't seen Casablanca, kids, it's a great, great, just watch it. 
or wait till you think you're showing it to a girlfriend for the first time. Win a 400 gigabyte Intel 750 series SSD from Intel and PC perspective because they want your rig to not only have the most badass blinged out graphics available in the universe, but you're going to have the fastest, assuming of course you have a compatible motherboard, uh, SSD that you can possibly get your grubby little mitts on. Um, the the SSD, Alan Malventano called, quote, the obvious choice for consumers who demand the most from their storage. PC Perspective Editor's Choice Award, gold star wearing 750 series 400 <laughs> gigabyte SSD. So this is this is the same SSD uh, that we are... We're in the middle of building a machine that can capture 4K60 uncompressed video. Mm -hmm. Um which requires just over a gigabyte per second sustained write speeds. Uh, and this is probably going to be the SSD that we integrate into that system as well. So if you ever have the need to record 4K60 uncompressed at 1 to 1 1.2 <laughs> gigabytes per second, um, this, this really SSD doesn't. should be able to handle it. Uh, and it turns out uh, when you have a 1.2 terabyte drive, mm -hmm. it doesn't take very long to fill it if you are recording... Uh, one gigabyte per second sustained rights to it. So, but you can get one, one for free again. Quick mention for so okay. I want to make sure people who maybe only hear of us and me from this week in computer hardware get their chance to win some free goods as well. So that's it. On that's all the promotional with the stuff we have to do there. <laughs> well, yeah, I, on behalf of the audience, I thank you. Hopefully, someone in our audience wins it. <laughs> Although winning in the PC per audience would be good. In any case, uh, Build 2015, um, I got hands-on with the HoloLens last week. Literally right after we ended the podcast, right. I packed my gear up and literally sprinted uh, around the Moscone to the Intercontinental to get the HoloLens demo. Um, you've got uh, something I think it's going to be impacting more people sooner, which is the final DirectX 12 reveal. Scott Michelle wrote this up for PC per. Um, I, I like the opening tagline, DirectX 12 has no more secrets <laughs> pretty <intense. laughs> it just sounds so yeah kind of frightening um, a little in a kind of awesome way yeah so what's going on there so so uh, what they what they announced basically is the idea of multi-adapter um which should sound very familiar it's when you can have multiple graphics adapters or multiple graphics processors in the same system and kind of utilize them in unique ways uh, it's very similar, to, you know, it's related to things like SLI and Crossfire. It's related to uh, how maybe OpenCL communicates mm -hmm. with processors today, you know, how you can combine the CPU compute resources and GPU compute, re compute resources for uh, similar workloads. Um, what what multi-adapter does is, is, is kind of unique because it adds some um, previously not really available or not easily available methods to take advantage of multiple GPUs. For example, the most direct one is implicit multi-adapter, which mm -hmm. is more or less regular standard crossfire and SLI that we know of today. Um, the, the developer kind of doesn't have any knowledge of what's going on. An NVIDIA driver or an AMD driver handles all of that. Right? That's what happens right. today. When you have an SLI system, the graphics system basically just sees, hey, there are compute, there's a GPU out there. Maybe, maybe not even see, doesn't even recognize that there's more than one out there. It may just see it as one. Uh, and the and the driver is responsible for dividing up the work and making sure it's timed out evenly and that it gets out to the display on time, et cetera, et cetera. That one's fairly, fairly easy to understand. Uh, you get into two explicit methods. You've got explicit linked which, as uh, Scott summarized to me, is when the cards can work so closely together that they appear like one. Um, it's similar to SLI and Crossfire, um, but the developer is handling it instead of the driver. Now, this is kind of what we had expected to be the case with DirectX 12. This is, this is more uh, in lines with when we first saw the reveal of DX12 and they talked about uh, multiple graphics systems working in a DX12 engine. This is kind of what we had in mind, where... Uh, a game developer like uh, Dice, who wrote the uh, the Frost engine uh, for Battlefield, for example, um, th if they see more than one GPU, they can access them individually, uh, decide which workloads they want to uh, pass to one versus pass to the other. Uh, but the assumption is kind of more or less that they are on similar performance levels. Uh, that they can make general assumptions about, well, if I send the same amount of work to GPU A and GPU B, I expect that those two workloads will be finished in approximately the same time, and thus I can help with my 
know, help simplify threading of, of the game processes and, and making things work that way. But it allows you to be more flexible in terms of not having any control over what work is going to what GPU. So right. in the past, we've had issues where deferred processing engines couldn't work with uh, multi-GPU systems initially because of how they're doing certain special effects. Well, if the developer has control over that, you know, and they're willing to put in the time to develop for multi-GPU platforms because it is a small group, uh, then they would be able to kind of avoid those issues day one out of the box uh, for some of these new games. So that's, that is explicit linked. And then the, the kind of more, the, the more exciting one, but I think less technically feasible, we'll see in the long term how this pans out, is explicit unlinked, which is where you can have arbitrary devices, uh, whether that be an, the GPU portion of an APU or a discrete card or a discrete card from a different vendor, um, all working together on DirectX graphics and compute capability, right? So this is the holy grail that everybody wants to see. This was when we first heard about a company called Lucid Logics that promised you could use an NVIDIA card and an AMD card in the same system and use, utilize them. And they were doing some, some background driver hackery. This is, you know, in, at its outset, the same idea that, okay, I bought a brand new AMD Radeon 390X, but I still have a GeForce GTX 970 in my system. It would be nice if I didn't have to throw that away and 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 or or sell it for pennies on the dollar or whatever it happens to be you can keep it in your system and maybe right. you get a 10 or 20 or 30 percent performance boost because hey we can the game engine can can utilize some of that compute capability or you kind of get into well i have an apu system or i have integrated graphics on my intel processor if i can get five or ten percent out of that for free, just by opening it up for use on this DirectX 12 game. Hey, that's a that's a benefit too. The problem is, is it's that's going to be incredibly complex. Um, even if it's possible that DirectX 12 is going to be smart enough to be able to handle a lot of the of the complexity there, but I still think developers mm -hmm. are going to have to spend a lot of time uh, integrating this type of stuff to realize any true potential and benefit from it. Um, this that that I think is the most interesting one, and, and I think it's it's definitely the point that got the most people excited. Like if you read the comments uh, after that, uh, I think it was that final third day keynote at the build conference. Right. The, the gamers and the PC enthusiasts got more excited about that because the that's always been the thing that we want, right? Is I don't mm -hmm. want to have to buy match GPUs. Maybe I can't find that GPU anymore. Maybe I got a better deal on this one, and you know you want to be able to to have some flexibility and freedom there. Uh, and it looks like. Microsoft is at least thinking ahead on that type of stuff. So maybe they'll have some uh, some hooks in there that developers can use to take advantage of it a little bit easier. That would be cool. Um, yeah. I don't know. It's, I, just, I mean, it, part of me is like, and it, it's it's kind of funny. By the time you, you know, if you wait a couple of years, you know, I'll, I'll be here to see the real world performance benefits of, say, taking, you know, a three-year-old GPU and adding in a brand new GPU and, and what the actual you know, effects are and, and how many years down the, down the development pike is going to be before, uh, before those start to kick in. Hmm. Yeah. I, I, they, you know, they don't give me time, you know, no software developer has come out and said that right. we're going to make a game like this. Um, but it, it, I will say the other thing that I found interesting from this is that the idea of implicit where regular SLI and crossfire still exist, like you mm -hmm. still can depend on the driver to do it. It makes me feel a little bit better because, I didn't. I didn't really. I don't really believe that there are many game developers that are going to be willing to spend the time to hand code multi GPU support. So as long as they can still say, "Hey, we'll allow implicit multi adapter support," and okay, now Nvidia and AMD, you're the ones that have to spend the time and money developing it and making sure it works right with your platforms. We basically right. will continue, uh, based you know, continue with the same process we have now uh, for DX12 that we have for DX11, if that's what the developer chooses to do. That would be good. Yeah, I don't know. It's I mean, it was it was it's funny because time frames of some of, uh, time frames for release is something I've been thinking around about, about a lot for the last couple of days because you know the Oculus Rift release is is twenty sixteen. Um, I realized earlier today I, I got the chance to hang out with the Tested guys and do their podcast, uh, the Tested dot com crew, and I realized you know what what somebody was referring to me is the you know the HTC uh, Vive is actually essentially Steam VR, and I was like, why is HTC? Oh, 
Oh, Steam. Yeah, I, I guess Steam has a chance in the VR world. But the uh, the when we were trying to get some information out of the Microsoft Hololens team about when Hololens was going, you know, when are the SDKs going to be available? You know, how long before we can buy Hololens? Um, the answer was in you know in the Windows 10 time frame, and and somebody was next to me was like, oh, so when Windows 10 is released, he's like, no, 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 in the Windows 10 time frame, and and I looked at <laughs> I looked at him, I said, you mean Hololens will release before Windows 11 and he goes yes <laughs> and I was like okay before so Windows 10 real support is end of life right HoloLens will be a thing gotcha HoloLens will Understood. be a thing but it's but you know what I mean it's like you know it, and I'm pretty sure you know obviously the the when the the Windows developers conference build 2015 was a big part of that was showing developers and getting like you know 70 or 100 developers at a time into a room and explaining how to develop for this but it still means they still you know it's okay the features announced and you're are you going to build it in your next game your current game can you even build it in your current game um um, so I, I'm stuff. curious, can, tell me just it, it, real quick, we don't have to go into it too much because I know you've talked sure. about it in other locations, but what was your experience using it? For the so first, that I was your first do, time using it. You weren't one of the people that used it no. in its original form and then saw this kind of reduced version. Right. Well, okay. So, uh, you know, it was, it was interesting. It was fun for me to listen. Um, I got to do the, the new screensavers with Leo on Saturday, which is really, really fun because I hadn't gotten to do something like that with Leo in a really long time. But one of the things yeah. they had was Mary Jo Foley and, uh, Paul Therott on talking about it. And, you know, Mary Jo and Paul, they're insiders. They're, they're full on hardcore windows journalists. So they got a hundred and what, you know, seven days ago, 110 days ago, they got to have one of the original demos, which had a full field of vision for your virtual reality. And for people that are listening and not watching, I'm sort of moving my hands from directly in front of my nose out towards my ears, a, you know, the kind of 180 degree immersive experience for the demos. And, and, you know, Mary Jo and, and, and Paul were very disappointed that this demo, which did not require like a backpack or a fanny pack full of computer, but was actually self-contained inside this very light and wearable headset, um, was more like, you know, a four by six card, a few inches in front of your face of, of mm. holographic overlay, um, which didn't really bother me so much because, you know, it's self-contained, it's battery powered, it's running off like a, you know, an Atom cherry trail processor or something, um, uh, you know, and their holographic processing unit. Um, so for me, I'm like, oh, okay. So it's like an alpha. It's an early version. Um, it was very, very, it was, it was interesting because the first demo they did was a, one that was like the ones we've seen from the big um, a keynotes where what you saw that was, you know, you know, Virch or, or in this case, actually uh, the holographic overlay stuff um, was shot by what I think is is a couple of red cameras. It's it's like a couple of red cameras, a connect, a monitor uh, for the 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 camera operator, and then another big regular video camera. Um, so they shoot the stereoscopic vision in time with the camera, uh, and they coordinate things with a connect, and that creates the overlay that you see on the big conference screen, which implies that your experience is going to be like I walk into a room, and there's stuff over there, and there's stuff over there, and all of this stuff is going on. So the first thing right. they showed us was interaction with 2D Skype and 3D Skype, where the person there were you know two developers and you know one was up front he put on the hololens and he's you know, showing off his his 3d models and he's making them bigger and smaller and look you know i i don't i they don't go through the table and then his friend calls and they talk on skype and he pins the skype window and his friend reaches you know through skype to hand him a 2d model um or you know sort of you know the guy in in, in 2d is kind of using uh a 2D interface on Skype, and they're both sort of working on a 3D model. Um, that was one of the things that you know, they made sure to mention, like the 3D printing engine, Windows 10, and the 3D modeling tools in Skype, and the Hololens, and and uh, it was interesting because that was that was like they were trying to make a really big point that hey, you know, 2D and 3D can coexist in some ways or or interact with each other. But where it got really really interesting was the next demo, which was the 
Trimble. In my case, I got to see a demo of the trim the Trimble building software. And architects are are, are light years ahead of, of most of the planet in terms of playing around with virtual reality. Because when you're trying to convince somebody to spend millions of dollars to build your building, you want to give them this very realistic, you know, opportunity for a walkthrough. And you know, they've created, you know, they've used the Unreal Engine to create walkthroughs in 3Ds. You know, I've seen, you know, the the, the, the it's just a, it's a it's an area where there's a lot of people very excited about using something like Hololens. Lens. And the one demo was, you know, it was like you, you're kind of four by six window of overlay looking at a maquette, which is a fancy architectural term for a model of a building. And, or in this case, it was a, uh, well, I, 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 I used no, the word maquette earlier and confused the hell out of a lot of people. Um, you know, because, it, you know, essentially like it was, it was like an empty city block surrounded by a bunch of buildings you know, and you looked at the design of this building on the screen and then you looked at it over here and you hit a button and boom, you know, there's your, there's your virtual building, um, your, your holographic building. And you could manipulate the building and you could move things from the 2D screen into the virtual environment. And then you could actually see from the different, you know, it was, it was really, really interesting, um, you know, how it worked and what you were looking at. It was really cool. And then you could turn around and, um, you know, the, the, the next thing we did was going over into this, they, they literally built a fake brick wall in the back of this hotel room so that you could pretend you were, you know, getting a, a message from a contractor who was like, hey, there's a structural steel beam here. We got to move this doorway. So as you're looking, you can see, okay, there's the doorway and I click a layer. Oh, there's a steel beam. Well, he wants to move it over here. Oh, let's do the overlay for the electrical. Oh, there's plumbing in the way and they've got to relocate that to make it work. So it's all very contrived, but the idea was that you got to use this, this, this virtual overlay in a real world environment and it worked and it was all self-contained. I don't know if the battery life on the headset was 15 hours or 15 minutes, um, but it worked. Um, everybody, I think, including me would like the full sort of 180 degrees of, of holographic overlay. And, and I think that'll come with time. Um, we'll find out. Um, but it was, it was, it was compelling and intriguing and interesting. And much like the Oculus Rift at, at CES, you know, like on one hand, I think they I think they're much farther ahead, and they know exactly what they want to do with this thing. Um, uh, Oculus Rift, I mean, you know, or or, yeah. or the, the Steam VR than the Microsoft Hololens team, but it didn't feel like 3D. Where every time I saw 3D, no matter how good the 3D experience was, all I could think was gimmick, gimmick, gimmick. Um, and in this case, it really was interesting and kind of fun. Like I don't think I would compute all of the time in that. Like you know. There's part of me that desperately wants the Jarvis experience so that when I'm wrenching on my truck in the basement of my multi-billion dollar Malibu, you know, bachelor pad, Iron Man sure. style, ask Jarvis and he'll post the specs for the flathead on my hot rod because, you know, we all have dreams. Um, you know, I don't want to wear the giant ski goggle, you know, motorcycle helmet face mask to do that. But I can see a lot of situations where it would be worthwhile or for gaming or stuff. It was very comfortable, actually. It was also surprised me because mm. the Oculus Rift, like the first couple of Oculus Rift iterations felt like, hey, let's strap a box of Kleenex to your face and, and right. you know, get queasy. Um, you know, <laughs> by the it sounds so appealing <laughs> when you say it like that. That's, <laughs> well, that should be on the box. Yeah, I'm sure that's a that's a pull quote that Facebook's <laughs> going to want from me. Um the, uh, <laughs> well, by the, I mean, that was the funny thing about the, the CES demo was like, it was, you know, I wasn't queasy and it was super compelling and I didn't feel like somebody had put a, you know, four pound weight on my nose for the previous hour. Um, and that's, it's interesting. It's, it's, it's really interesting to watch a bunch of this stuff evolve. I know what the future of it's going to be. Um, yeah. you know, I think the, the path is much clearer in a lot of ways on the Oculus Rift side than the HoloLens, you know, but the HoloLens seems to be, you know, I don't know if this was like in a skunk works for the past few years or if Microsoft is just hammering on this as fast as they can, but it feels really, really compelling. Mm -hmm. Um, good. if that makes sense. Yeah. So I'm eager good. to try it out. Hopefully, hopefully sometime soon. I wouldn't be, you know, A3, I think is, 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 mm. it sounded like there would be a lot of, of activity at E3. I could be wrong about that. Cool. Fison S10 Roundup, Kingston Hyper X Savage versus Patriot Ignite versus Corsair Neutron XT. You know, I got to say with these names, are we talking SSDs? Are we talking <laughs> external thumb drives? Are we talking gaming controllers or or mice? You're right. When, when the names of Ignite <laughs> and Savage surely bring about different connotations than SSDs, but we are talking about kind of standard SATA 
SSDs. Right. Uh, the Fizon S10 controller is one that we have seen before reviewed initially with the Corsair Neutron XT. The new variants here are the um, HyperX Savage and the Patriot Ignite. You can see that picture right there kind of basically sums up the primary differences between the two devices. You've got one that looks like uh, a standard SSD with a sticker and then one that has um, kind of more or less uh, a, a fancier package. And actually, I'm, I'm holding, Alan brought them over for me. Like this one here, the Patriot, it's it's very light. It, uh, it feels like a bunch of other cheap SSDs that we've had. This, this HyperX, it's, it's heavier, it's beefier. You can see it just looks neater as well. I don't know how much mm -hmm. that buys you in terms of credibility with an audience for an SSD, but in terms of build quality, this one has it in spades over both the Neutron and the, uh, the Patriot Ignite for whatever that's worth. So actually, I've never actually held this until now. It, it, it's high end. It feels like a high end device. Um, now, the, the quick and dirty of this is, is that we know the traits of this controller. It's, it's a reasonably fast SATA 6 gigabit per second SSD controller. It doesn't blow anything out of the water. It's not the fastest, but it's not the slowest that we've seen. Um, it does really well in our file copy tests, for example. But if you look at uh, IOs per second, it's not really tuned for that. It's kind of towards the bottom of the stack of, of, of modern SSDs in that regard. Uh, but I don't think anybody that buys ha or buys or has one of these SSDs would, would notice some dramatic slowdown compared to another SSD in their system. Um, the, the, the kind of... Uh, Interesting part here is if you look at if you look at pricing, right? Because again, when we start to get into SATA SSDs that are in a two and a half inch form factor like this, it's unfortunate for these guys. But the primary differentiation factor at this point is still cost. Um, <laughs> the Kingston HyperX Savage with the fancy case uh, is relatively expensive. You know, if you get the 120 gig model, it's about 76 cents per gig. And then the lowest price is at the 480 gig model, 52 cents per gigabyte. Uh, it's That's not horrendous, but it's not fantastic. If you look at the Patriot Ignite, which is basically the exact same hardware inside a different shell, you're looking at 40 cents per gig. So the 480 mm -hmm. gig drive is $190 instead of $250. That's a $60 difference. That's a pretty dramatic price jump. Uh, that's that's like that's a full brand new AAA PC title that you could download instead uh, for what what is basically the exact identical performance between the two drives. And you can see the Corsair Neutron down there is again it's kind of on the high side price wise, uh, more comparable to the HyperX than the Patriot. Um, so that's I mean that's kind of where you're at. The the problem is for all of these drives, all three of them, is that. Drives like the Crucial BX100 or MX1 uh, BX100 exist at a lower cost per gig that have very adequate performance. And then if you're looking for high performance, you have stuff like the 850 Evo and the 850, you know, series of SSD from Samsung that tend to be on the highest end of, of SATA drives. So right. they're in that middle ground where they're, they're, they're hoping a brand and a marketing and things like, hey, this looks really cool. And I would say... If I were going to mount an SSD visible in a system, this is probably the coolest one I've seen. Maybe if you take like one of the older Intel drives that has a skull logo on the top of it or something like that, maybe that maybe <laughs> exceeds this. But this, it's shiny and it's heavy and weighty. So if you if, if you ever need to pass SSDs around to people, uh, this would be the most impressive one for that. If you just, you know coffee table artwork or something. <laughs> so not a good use for fails, 240 gig SSD. Using. Right, there you go. It has tremendous yeah. future paperweight potential. <laughs> it does. It does. They're, they're fine drives. Uh, they just don't do anything that really stands out, uh, either pricing-wise or performance-wise, right. to kind of get a whole bunch of attention. So that's, that's, that's pretty much where we're at on those, on those drives. So you're not saying it's, it's bad. You're just saying it's typical. Yes, correct. <laughs> it's not a bad drive. I don't think if you own one of these, you should feel bad about yourself or you should try to figure out how to return it. Um, but if I were buying an SSD, depending on what my needs were, if I wanted, I, hey, I need a low-cost SSD that's going into a dual-core notebook, uh, right. I would probably find something that is less expensive than this. If I'm building a high-end machine and I want two drives and I want to get a, a maximum performance out of a rate zero, I'd probably probably go with something else as well. So it's in, it's in the middle ground. Really it makes it pretty difficult. drive. Yeah. You'll want to hold for a long time before you stuff it inside. 
it's true. Your case, collecting dust on it. This is your drive. It's very true. You know, if you're thinking about buying mom an SSD <laughs> for Mother's Day, you're probably pretty awesome. Uh, but a lot of people out there are probably thinking about flowers. And this episode of This Week Computer Hardware is brought to you by Pro Flowers. Mother Day is May 10th. That's Sunday, people. It's I got to get soon. busy. Um, Pro Flowers, fortunately, has got you covered. You get a dozen rainbow roses in a free glass vase for just $19.99 plus shipping. And uh, it's pretty cool. So let me make this abundantly clear uh, as, you know, I have a wife who was a mother and I have a mother and Ryan, I presume, has a mother and he has a wife who's about to be a mother. You you, mm -hmm. you did come from a mom, not from a lab, right, Ryan? Correct. Yeah, um, last I checked. <laughs> just double checking. Yep. You never know. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, appreciating your mom's Mother's Day doesn't have to be stressful. It doesn't have to be fraught. Pro Flowers makes buying a beautiful gift for your mom simple and quick and they've got everything you need for Mother's Day for all the moms in your life. You choose the delivery date you want and it's guaranteed. And best of all, their flowers are guaranteed to be fresh and beautiful for at least seven days after you receive them. It's a really easy website to use. Did you, I, I believe, understand, made some purchases on Pro Flowers, sir? I did. Uh, and and I guess it made more sense last week for me to say this. I did it in a preemptive, oh no, I don't want to wait to the last minute gesture, right? I went in and I bought flowers for my mother. I bought flowers for my wife, scheduled the delivery, planned ahead, now I don't have to feel like, oh no, it's Thursday night and I'm nervous, uh, you know, that type of stuff. But now for people who are listening, it's Thursday night. You need somebody to help you out with this stuff. And proflowers.com will make sure uh, you can still uh, meet your necessary motherly's, or Mother's Day duties, I guess. Yeah. Just don't wait too long because, you know, if you want the Mother's Day guarantee... Uh, you have until Friday, May 8th. And if you do decide to take advantage of proflowers.com, as you can see in, in the screen, if you're watching on video, there's some unbelievably bright and vivid and exciting bouquets. Um, but, you know, there's a special offer Proflowers has for fans of Twit. You get a dozen rainbow roses in a free glass vase for $19.99 plus shipping. You can upgrade to two dozen roses, uh, rainbow roses in a free glass vase for just $9.99 more. Just remember you have until Friday, May 8th to take advantage of this offer. And if you order by then, you can still get guaranteed delivery for Mother's Day. So Friday, people, when you're listening to this podcast and you realize, oh no, I need something for mom, you have Friday, May 8th, if you want to get it delivered on Mother's Day. That's proflowers.com. Use the code TWIT and you're going to score a dozen rainbow roses and a free glass vase for only $19.99 plus shipping. And we want to thank ProFlowers for their support. And on behalf of TWIT to all the mothers out there, happy Mother's Day. Indeed. And uh, don't forget, it's also okay to buy mom an SSD if it's actually for mom. <laughs> buy mom an SSD for your computer. No bueno, no good. Don't don't pull the uh, Homer Simpson and buy your <laughs> wife a bowling ball that says Homer on it with the intent that she won't want it and give it to you instead. That's not that's not an appropriate uh, option for here. It's yeah. wrong is what it is. It's wrong <laughs> and terrible, and you will be punished for it by the universe. <laughs> AMD previews new flagship GPU with HBM and 3X performance per watt improvements. One of the things that AMD has been getting hammered on for the last year, uh, certainly by NVIDIA marketing and, and in, the, in the benchmarks when we start taking a look at the performance of AMD cards, is the fact that they suck down a lot of wattage. Uh, however, uh, just yesterday, uh, during the 2015 AMD Financial Analysis Day, CEO Dr. Lisa Liu discussed some of the details of the upcoming Enthusiast Radeon graphics process. And I think the big deal, uh, and you you were listening closely with keyboard in hand. They're talking about, a, they're not kidding, an actual tripling or a one-third the wattage for the same performance. I mean, are they, are they getting real about reducing power consumption on AMD GPUs? So what's interesting about this, this it's not so much on the... It depends on how you brand, how you name it GPU, right? So what HBM <laughs> is, okay. and this it's it's not a what the definition of is is argument because the GPU what HBM does is it brings memory off of the PCB and brings it onto the chip, not onto the GPU itself, not onto the same die as the GPU. It is on a in a silicon interposer, right? So basically, imagine you have like a wafer. And then on the left-hand side, you'll have the GPU. And on the right-hand side, you'll have memory. And now the proximity of that memory to the GPU means that it doesn't have to go very far. It can run at very high speeds. 
and it can mm -hmm. run at a very wide bandwidth without costing a lot of money in board design or additional complexity in chip design, right? So the, the power right. savings they're getting here are not on the GPU itself, but on the memory and the memory interface. Now, we do, what we don't know yet is it's always been the case that a part of a GPU's power consumption is how much, how wide the memory bus is, how fast it's moving, and, you know, moving memory around is a very power intensive thing. Now, the GPU will still be moving memory around. It will just be moving it around faster, which in theory could lower the total overall power consumption of the GPU. But the HBM itself, the high bandwidth memory itself, will be able to run at extremely low power compared to GDDR5 memory, which is what the standard is today for AMD and NVIDIA graphics cards. So their quote is, what do they say? Um, More than three times performance per watt compared to GDDR5. So now if you think about it, if you, if you try to do some math, there have been papers that have put out about HBM. HBM is not an AMD creation. It is an industry creation. Uh, and the first generation of it, I think, is rated at about 1,000 gigabytes per second, um, mm -hmm. bi-directional, right? So 500 each way, I think. And if you look at the current flagship graphics card from AMD, it is rated at 320 gigabytes per second. So you are more than tripling your amount of memory bandwidth and if you assume that's at the same power envelope, then that would where that would be where you would get, you know, an increase in in memory efficiency, right? Uh, but right. it does say you get more than fifty percent power savings versus GDDR5 as well. So all that kind of will play into what the actual rated speed of the memory is when it starts shipping, and then how much power savings you actually get. I I, I think. I think it will it will definitely improve AMD's situation in terms of how Nvidia continues to develop very power efficient GPUs and AMD had gone the other direction for a couple of years, making more power hungry GPUs. Mm -hmm. Now what they could do is AMD could, if they want to <laughs> choose to make the GPU more power hungry, knowing that it has more headroom to work with now that the memory is using less power. So maybe the GPU okay. itself will consume less power, but the total package the graphics card itself, if you will, will consume about the same power. It's possible that it may it may go that route. Um, and, you know, they didn't announce the product specifically here. They didn't give it a name. They didn't talk about anything else really than the HBM features of it. So we don't really know. You have no idea what clock speeds are. You have no idea what they're not talking about the total power efficiency of a GPU yet. But they did say uh, that it would be in the coming weeks, right? A several weeks, right. a handful of weeks. Those terminologies were used very frequently. So it's, it's looking like a Computex or a uh, E3 timeframe release for whatever this new magical part appears to be. But it does look, it does look very interesting. And uh, I, I think you'll see a HBM is, is the direction that high-performance chips are going in. NVIDIA's talked about HBM being and then their next, next generation GPU mm -hmm. past Maxwell. So NVIDIA will get there as well. AMD is going to be there first. It may be that they think they need to to remain competitive and stay competitive in, in, in the market. So hopefully it works out for them and they put out a kick butt part for uh, enthusiasts to, to buy up. That would make you very happy. That would make it all would. of us very happy. And it would yeah. keep the pressure on NVIDIA to keep their prices down, which would make uh -huh. even more people happy. Leaked AMD Fiji card imagined images, excuse me, show small form factor water cooler integration. Quote, to file this under rumor for sure, writes Mr. Ryan Stroud, but a cool one nonetheless on PCPro.com. Um, this is kind of cool. Do you, th you know, how do, how do you feel about the rumor mongering from chiphell.com, which is such a glorious name for a website? It is. Uh, it's even more odd because it's a Chinese website, so it's kind of... <laughs> I don't know. So that picture... It's a thing. <laughs> yeah. The, the picture there that you're looking at, if I had to bet, I would say is probably real. And okay. the reason I say that is it's always been rumored that the 390X or the Fiji part, whatever the new flagship branding will be, uh, was going to use water cooling, and that is using water cooling. The part that confuses me a little bit is you'll see like at the top, it's, it's more like a traditional... Uh, GPU water block where it has like outlets and inlets for barbs as opposed to you don't see the the tubing coming off of it already like it is a normal self-contained pre-manufactured ready to install add-in card right so that gives me a little bit of where because I don't think AMD would 
make people install their own water cooling uh, for uh, a GPU off the shelf. But if you look at the shortness of that card, um, that might be off-putting as well. Well, no flagship GPU can be that can be that short. That's more like your GTX 960s or whatever that are ITX, you know, branded. But because of the integration of HBM and then no longer having a need to have memory off of the uh, uh, off of the chip and on the PCB and kind of routed in a way so that you can get a, a PCB design and layers and and traces to everything uh, properly. You are going to be able to get a GPU using a, with only HBM memory to work in different form factors than you were able to get before. So it's very possible that the flagship GPU from AMD this year could be this incredibly small uh, graphics card design, yet still have all of the performance of, you know, a flagship GPU that you would expect out of a flagship GPU. Um, I think it looks really cool. I hope it's not fake for AMD's sake because like all, all of the feedback in our comments and on other people's forums has been very positive about the look and the style of it. So if it is fake, I bet there are people named you going, oh man, how, how quickly can we change our design to look like this and make it, make it, uh, you know, similar styling and, 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 and whatnot. But I don't know. I, I, you never know with these things, but right. uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all if this is what it looks like. And I think that Sometimes, especially in a market where people are very finicky about right. uh, what products they buy, and what brands they support, look and style and cool factor can make a big difference, especially if you're one of the guys that's struggling to gain back some market share uh, that was lost over the last year or two. While we regather ourselves, let us take a moment to thank our, our second sponsor of this episode of This Week in Computer Hardware, our friends at iFixit.com, the free online repair manual for everything. This, ladies and gentlemen... Is a pretty badass set of tools. It's the 54-bit driver kit for my fix-it. It's a staple in my daily use. It's a staple of a PC per .com. Um, If you've never been to iFixit.com, you really should go check it out. Um, they have noble goals that I fix it. You know, yes, they sell. If you're looking to repair the screen, you know, on your iPhone or on your Mac, they have instructions and parts for that. But what's really amazing is they're trying to be the the free online repair manual for everything. They have more than 10,000 repair guides for everything from electronics like your smartphones or tablets and game consoles to your home appliances, clothing, even your bike. They're, they're, they're going big. They want you to keep things running, keep them out of landfills, save yourself some money. So what they do is they put together foolproof instructions to fix your stuff. You know, how many iPhone screens have I shattered? The world has lost count. Uh, but if you need to repair the red ring of death in your Xbox, swap the battery in your Galaxy S5, I fix it as you covered with parts, tools, and repair guides. I fix it also makes the most trusted repair tools for consumer electronics, including the ProTech Toolkit. Um, and what I'm holding here is just one part of the ProTech Toolkit. Uh, the ProTech Toolkit 70 tools, uh, mods, malfunctions, misfortunes. The ProTech Toolkit is going to help you deal with that. It's used in garages like my own. It's used in the Hack 5 warehouse. I'm here in the tested offices right now where I just recorded a podcast. They use this actual toolkit I'm holding right now, the 54-bit driver kit, which is part of the ProTech Toolkit. Um, it's 54 standard specialty and security bits, Phillips bits, the dreaded pentalobe bits that are used on iPhones and Mac laptops, Torx and Torx security bits, tri-wing bits, which are used on video game consoles, even the ever so rare triangle bit, which is used for McDonald's toys. I fix it once you be able, once you to be able to fix things. Uh, and you know, if you can't open it, do you really own it? As far as I fix it is concerned, the answer is no. So they've got the bits to help you get in there. There's a really nice, and I got to say, I've been using it a lot lately. There's a swivel top precision driver. I've used it actually, I'm sure I've mentioned this every time we've talked about this in the last six months. I just used it again to tighten the Torx bolts on the toilet seat in my house. <laughs> I don't know what the kids are doing. Um, but it's a really nice driver. Somebody's used a lot of tools over the years. It's a good classic precision driver. And because sometimes you need torque, you have the ability to... Mm. You know, stick another screwdriver in there and crank away. Just make sure you press down hard enough on that uh, on that screw so that you don't tear it up. 
Um, it's a really cool kit. Anti-static wrist strap, if you're the one person in North America that actually uses one. Nylon spudgers, metal spudgers, plastic opening tools for prying and scraping. For example, if you've got to get all the nasty bits off of a screen uh, and the back of the uh, case before you put a new tablet screen on. Uh, it all comes in a really nice little tool roll, so you can roll all of your tools up and immediately know if something's missing. And right there, you're looking at a whole bunch of the other awesome tools that are available at ifixit.com. Um, this is good stuff. $65, $64.95, backed by lifetime warranty. You can use it to fix just about anything around your house. Uh, and, you know, like I said, I've used it for toilets, people use it for eyeglasses, cabinet doors. Um, you know, if you've got somebody in your life that likes to fix things or work on models, this would be a really cool gift for them. And you can tell them about the thousand of free iFixit guides to help put your tools to use ifixit.com slash twit please go there for more than 10,000 free step-by-step -step guides ifixit also sells every part and tool you'll need enter in the code twitch that's t-w-i-c-h at checkout you'll save yourself ten dollars off any purchase of fifty dollars or more that's ifixit.com slash twit use the code twitch to save yourself ten dollars and go fix something you'll feel really good when you're done fixing makes people happy at least me new g-force bundle Witcher 3, Batman Arkham Knight. I feel it. I, I feel, is it wrong to say that Batman Arkham Knight is just, is is it feeling old for a bundle or am I just that out of touch on the awesomeness Arkham Knight, of Arkham Knight? Arkham Knight is not out yet. But oh, that would explain there are why quite a few oh, Arkham speaking of the previous games. Arkham Asylum. Yeah, there's Arkham My Asylum. Apologies. I think there was Arkham Origins. Uh, there was, this is the fourth one, I think. So there was, a, there was another one in there too. Arkham... City, yes, Arkham City. That was another one as well. Uh, it does. I will admit, I will agree that it is. It, it can be a confusing naming scheme, without any kind of numerals in there for you to understand that well, this is the fourth one or the third one or whatever it is, and only you know having so many similar words in there. Uh, so it's not out yet, and neither is The Witcher Three, the other game in this bundle, um, which I think actually adds to their uh, appeal, if you will. Mm -hmm. the, a lot of times when you get game bundles, they're games that are already out or are just recently released. And maybe if you're if you're an enthusiast PC gamer that's looking at buying new graphics cards fairly frequently, you're probably also the kind of person that's going out there and buying the game day one. You've got it pre-ordered, you've got it pre-loaded, you're ready to go. Uh, with these two games, it's probably not the case. I know Witcher, The Witcher 3 comes out on May 19th, so it's still 12 days from now. And I think Batman is uh, in middle of June or early middle of June, uh, the next month mm -hmm. after. So... It's a good time as any to, to get in on that. If you have not seen gameplay footage of The Witcher 3, it is astounding looking. It is, a, it is going to really? be a graphically intense title um, that I think somebody said, I think I read somewhere that they promised 100 hours of gameplay. It's like an RPG open world style gameplay. That's um, cool. It's, it's going to be pretty it's gorgeous. Cool. Yeah, and, and I, I'm, I'm looking forward to playing it. Uh, we're, we're trying to debate if we have time to maybe like set up some game streams and stuff where maybe I walk through and show myself dying repeatedly uh, in the game <laughs> on a live stream. I've been in contact with the guys, the developers there, seeing if they want to donate some game keys and whatnot for uh, for the stream. So hopefully we can get something like that set up. But um, they're they're part of the uh, what is it the the game works mm -hmm. package of uh, stuff from Nvidia. So they have some Nvidia like I think the right. fur on the on the Animals in the game use uh, NVIDIA technology, for example, if you have a GeForce card. So that's kind of why they're being associated with the NVIDIA bundle. So if you buy a 980 or 970, you get two games for free. And if you buy a 960, nice. you get The Witcher for free still. And then I believe this is one of the few times we've seen mobile GPUs included in this. So if you buy a laptop with a 980M or a 970M, you also get The Witcher 3 for free. Um, you know, cool. if, you, if you look at like the 970 being a $320 video card, getting $100 to $120 worth of games included in there. It's a pretty good, pretty good deal. And especially considering, again, these, are, these aren't last year's games or two years ago's games or anything like that. These are brand new titles that I think uh, will show off the power of, of uh, any new graphics system as well as uh, just be fun to play. So if you're I'm hunting excited. for graphics three cards... Demo. Yeah, <laughs> The Witcher 3 demo is up on YouTube, uh, all the way up to 1080p 60 frames per second if you want to see it look pretty freaking glorious. Yeah. But you will have to check that you're willing to see potentially frightening and terrifying content. So apparently is there is blood. 
It's not a kid. <laughs> it's not a kid kid friendly game for sure. Uh, in that demo, so there's like there's lots of beheadings. There's there's several people being cut in half, and it's a lot of blood spewing everywhere. It's uh, it, it's yeah, it's not a family friendly title, but it's such a such is life. Title. Yes. Yeah. Oh my goodness! So much excitement uh, earlier this week. Uh, you know, something we've been waiting for a long time. Uh, the Oculus Rift has a release date, range of release dates, a potential time of release, uh, early 2016, pre-orders before the end of this year. So ostensibly, you can buy your gamer or yourself or your child a, you know, you'll probably get a little coupon you can put in the stocking or under the tree or next to the dreidel or or wherever you want to celebrate your Christmas holiday. Um, yep. Because the Rift pre-orders start in 2015. The Rift is actually going to ship in Q1. Uh, our understanding at this point is that it's going to be very close to the Crescent Bay model. We, we got our faces stuffed inside of its CES 2015. We're guessing it's going to be in the $300 price range, but nobody really knows at this point because that information has not um, been released. But, you know, Rift is coming and uh, it's going to come for real uh, in the beginning of uh, in the beginning of 2016. So. so what's your what's your interest level in this? Let's say I think I heard him say that it will be slightly more expensive than the Galaxy Gear VR, which sells for two ninety nine. Mm -hmm. So let's assume it's three fifty or three ninety nine. Right. Um, what do you what are, what is what is your estimate of consumer interest in purchasing this device? Kind of let's say it's January twenty sixteen or February right. twenty sixteen, like right after CES. You know, it's it's interesting because my 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 whole sort of you know my whole interest in VR didn't really start to peak. Um, until I got that Crescent Bay demo at CES 2015, right? Um, number one. Number two, um, you know, HoloLens looks really interesting, but, you know, it, like I said earlier, its its release date is not only not imminent, it is completely unknown. Um, I was kind of laughing about the HTC uh, Vive until I realized that's essentially Steam VR. Um, you, right. know, w you know, Will Smith on test very patiently explained to me, he's like, it's the Valve one. I was like, oh, well, that's different. Um, you know, because yeah. I was like, why is a oh oh, HTC's building Valve's uh, yep. thing. So um, I think it's going to be really, I, I think I, I think a lot of it depends on what comes at E3 this summer or, you know, maybe E3 and PAX. I'm imagining E3 is going to be the big one. Um, whoever's got the most compelling gameplay, right? You know, is, is Facebook, you know, okay, there's probably not going to be virtual snogging in Facebook's, uh, you know, <laughs> Rift application. Uh, you know, anytime I can say snogging uh, is, is a good day. Yeah, I, I, I go for it. But you know what I mean? Like, is, it's, I'm very curious, like, what is, you know, what is Facebook going to do with the Oculus interface? Is it suddenly going to be super compelling for grandparents to be in a VR environment with their grand? Like, what what is it? What are they going to do with it? Right? Because they've got enough money to figure out a bunch of cool stuff. They're they're working on the controller furiously. I think it's kind of been the the big story that's coming out. You know, um, Will Smith said, you know, the HTC Vive was the kind of bestest, most compelling, most incredible, I want this product demo he's ever had, which is saying something because the dude's been through all the product demos, um, you know, first with Maximum PC and then tested. So uh, now I want to get the the, the Vive uh, headset demo with Steam VR. Um, you know, I, I, I'm really curious because I've seen so much bad VR over the last 20 years. It's finally yeah. getting good. You know, it's finally getting interesting. We finally have the computational power and the graphics power to make it really engaging. So, you know, it's would, also going to be freaking expensive for the first couple of years, if not yeah. moving forward after that. I, th I think a $400 add-on to a PC that will probably have somewhat limited game mm -hmm. support um, is, is a lot to ask. Yeah. One thing I, I actually, this is a talk that came out in March, uh, from the F8 conference, Facebook's conference. If you didn't right. go, if you didn't watch, uh, Mike, Michael Abrash, A-B-R-A-S-H, he did a talk at F8 titled why virtual reality will matter to you. And, um, it's the interesting part about the talk that I listened to, I actually just listened to it today was 
focusing on the reality portion of the mm -hmm. word virtual reality instead of the virtual portion of it. And it's hard to explain why that is interesting. But uh, if you watch the video, I think his portion of it's only about 30 minutes long. Um, so it, it's definitely worth viewing uh, because, you know, he talks, you know, he, he does the normal thing. He's like, hey, I remember uh, seeing, you know, watching movies about the holodeck or watching shows with the holodeck. Right. Uh, but then the Matrix came out and they, they talk about how uh, um, Morpheus's line where he tries to define what is real. Real reality is just electrical impulses being interpreted by your brain. <laughs> so they dive into, you know, tricks of the mind, how they can fool your mind and, into saying things in the real world that are not really there, right? Just optical effects and illusions right. and, and whatnot. And then how that translates over to, to virtual reality and what they can actually do. Uh, for people in the near term as well as uh, further out into the future. It's, it's a really interesting talk. Um, I don't think it's going to make people buy a whole bunch of these things until you get compelling <laughs> real-world use applications for it. Um, but it's more than just gaming, which is, which is really, I think, yeah. important for us to, to realize. So check that out if you, if you haven't seen it yet. Um, it's pretty neat stuff. Yeah, I think it's going to be interesting. I had a, part of me doesn't think VR is going to work until you're, you know, stuffing it into a jack in the back of your neck. Um, I could be oh wrong. <laughs> uh, we're we're going to find out a lot about that in the next uh, in the next year, I think. So yeah, it'll be exciting. Yep. We are just about to hit our heart out on this episode of Twitch. Um, anything you can talk about that's coming up on PC per in the next week? <sighs> So we have, we have, I'm looking as he looks around the office again, we have uh, some interesting <laughs> stuff. Uh, I, I'm finishing up writing a review of the Core i7 variant of the Broadwell Nook, um, which will be in a box like this. It's not this particular unit. And I was surprised how much faster the Core i7 variant of the Broadwell, it's still a dual core part, dual core hyperthreaded part. I was surprised how much faster it was than the, uh, the lower TDP variant. It has higher in graphics and a higher in CPU in it, which is which is kind of nice. And it had they added support for NVMe SSDs. So this little guy here gets 2.2 gigabyte per second read speeds um, in an M.2 NVMe PCI Express form factor, which is which is pretty compelling when you can shove it into a device that's like this size, right? So that's that's definitely worth uh, worth looking at. Alan is working on a review of uh, an Acer IPS G-Sync panel that does 144 hertz. So 144 hertz IPS G-Sync 2560 by 1440 panel, which is actually really, really nice. So he's working on that. And then um, we've got some... Everything's hidden now. All the lights are shining on me in the middle of the day, so I don't, I don't have to <laughs> I keep, keep looking around. How about this? We got a racing chair for computer gamers to sit. Yeah. Like, it's just a desk chair, but it looks like a racing chair. And it's a fantastic chair that has a reclined functionality if you want to take a nap. You, you can we'll build talk those, about that. by the way. My favorite one was the racing, the, 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 the base that converted your racing chair, your Baja chair, into a... Uh, into a rocking chair. That was a personal favorite. <laughs> That's a good idea. Um, See? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Uh, Withings has a new HD home camera. Very stylish. Uh, Shannon reviewed that on uh, Tech Thing this week. Um, I went off on the Apple Watch. I'm not even going to go into it. Just go to techthing.com or youtube.com slash techthing. Uh, and I, I talked a whole bunch about the HoloLens experience. And we've got three ways you can speed up 802.11n, which kind of refers back, uh, a, building on what we were talking about with a viewer question that Leo and I answered on the new screensavers uh, last Saturday, which was discussing, uh, I got kind of more in-depth on things you can do to make 802.11 run faster. Uh, or at least closer to the theoretical speeds than the terrible real world speeds. You know, I, the more I time, I the longer I hate 802.11n. <laughs> That's just all I'm going to say. 802.11g, 802.11ac, goodness. 802.11n, not so goodness, um, to use sophisticated language. Um, <laughs> uh, but you can go check that out on techthing.com. And also, uh, if you're feeling a little paranoid about what's going on in the world, although, you know, the the... Darren from Hack Five, uh, one of my partners in crime, 
Um, we shoot tech thing in the Hack Fives warehouse. Uh, we uh, just relaunched a show called Threat Wire we, that uh, Darren and Snubs used to do, and I'm helping out with that. Where we take uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we talk about the biggest, um, you know, security. Uh, um, security threats, security news, and uh, and internet sort of freedom threats, and we kind of go in depth on that. So I think one of the big ones tomorrow is going to be discussing the fact that the courts have now decided that the NSA can't legally do what it's been doing in terms of collecting telephone metadata <laughs> and what that means in the real world, which is probably nothing until Congress finally uh, gets enough of a fire under its collective posteriors to do something. Um, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we'll see. Oh, and by the way, uh, we didn't mention it, but Comcast has decided that customer service should probably be a priority if they want to do their next merger to take over the world successfully. <laughs> you can't just spend hundreds of zillions of dollars in D.C. I'm exaggerating, I know. Um, but perhaps public image is critical to the success of the company moving forward. So they're going to add like 5,500 customer service people. They promise to actually have their tech show up on time. Uh, you know, I don't think they're going to go from a four-hour window to a one-hour window, but they say if they're late, they'll credit you $20. And apparently there's going to be sort of Uber-style tracking of, of the Comcast technicians. So you can go to a website and see exactly where the person is while Sounds they're not dangerous. working on your house. Yeah, I, I actually, <laughs> I do not envy, I do not envy uh, the customer service technicians from, uh, from uh, I, I, I would not want to have to deal with, like, so you know, in the first day they put that on, somebody's going to get beat down in somebody else's front yard because, you know, they're running late and, and somebody tracked them on the, on the technician tracking monitor and went to the house and started screaming at them, beating their van with a tire iron or something. Um, yeah, this is an exciting, brave new world out there. And, and sometimes it scares the snot out of me. VR, though, is exciting. <laughs> we may not be able to do anything with it, but it'll be exciting. And with that bright and cheerful thought, I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Schrout. We'll see you next week on Twitch.